Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us. We welcome you to the World Bank's Agriculture Finance Support Facility webinar. Today's topic is Adventures in Smallholder Financing, a Tale of Two Innovative Lending Approaches, presented by Mike Warmington of One Acre Fund and Ben Schmerler of Root Capital. I'm Tamara Palmer, and I am assisting with today's webinar. Now, before we proceed, I'd like to provide a quick tour of the webinar space. Participants are all on mute. If you need to connect with the facilitator or tech team, please send your questions through the Q&A chat box feature, which uh, should be found on the right side of your WebEx screen. If you're having technical difficulties and can't use the chat box, please email Rebecca Rivola. We're going to provide you that email address right now. Just a second, we'll email that over to you. Now, this morning's webinar is facilitated by Alberto Milan, Agricultural Specialist with the World Bank. And after each speaker, uh, he'll be giving a brief or overview of the organization. He will help uh, facilitate the conversation with the presenters. And the last 15 to 20 minutes of our time together will be a question and answer session. So please do send your questions throughout the webinar using the chat box feature. And it would be really helpful if you can indicate who you are addressing those questions to, either Mike or Ben or both. All right, and I just would like to take a minute to make sure that our speakers are off of mute. Alberto, are you with us? Are you, are you able to connect with your audio? Yeah. Hi, Tamara. Very I good. Can you. Well, Mike, thank you. are you with us, sir? Yep. Hi, Tamara. Hi, everyone. Very good. And Ben, are you back with us? Okay, Ben, we'll work on Ben's sound in just a minute. Um, before I turn it over, I'd like to uh, introduce each of these speakers. Mike Warmington has worked in finance and microfinance for more than a decade. He's currently Director of Microfinance Partnerships for One Acre Fund, a social enterprise working with more than 400,000 farmers in East Africa. The Microfinance Partnerships team aims to increase the overall availability and impact of smallholder financial services working through partnerships with financial service providers. Prior to One Acre Fund, Mike was head of operations at Micro Loan Foundation, working in Malawi and Zambia. Before working in the finance sector, Mike spent two years as an analyst at Dexia Bank, a Belgian bank specializing in project finance. Ben Schmerler is responsible for overseeing all of Root Capital's philanthropy fundraising, building relationships and engagement strategies with existing and potential donors, investors, government institutions, and value chain actors. He provides management, oversight, and leadership towards achieving Root Capital's strategic objectives. Previously, Ben was a senior global supply chain manager at Fairtrade USA, and he had spent many years working and bicycling across the planet. Ben is a member of the Sustainable Council for the Specialty Coffee Association of America and owns a small espresso bar in Boston. He holds a BA in Environmental Policy and Political Science from the University of Washington and speaks French, Spanish, and Wolof. All right, thank you, everyone. Uh, Alberto, I'm going to turn it over to you now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tamara. Thank, uh, thank you, everyone, for joining today, especially Mike and Ben. Um, we are really lucky and happy to have you here with us and learn more about the business models and the organizations that you are working for and what lending models you guys are operating. So basically, we would like to hear a bit more of the basic introduction of what your organization does, what is the basic operating uh, lending model, and the key characteristics or features of each business model. And we would start with, with Mike. And then we'll give the floor to Ben, and then we will continue engaging in a conversation with both colleagues uh, to learn more about uh, their businesses and the way they run it. So, Mike, if you don't mind 
just starting and then giving us a brief introduction of what one actually does and how it does it. The floor is yours. Great. Thank you, uh, Alberto, and thanks, everyone, for joining. Um, we have a, I've got a few slides here to, to talk over for, for five minutes or so, just to give you an overview of the organization. So for those of you who aren't familiar with One Acre Fund, we're a, we're a non-profit organization, but we, we do operate much like a business. Uh, we were established 10 years ago and currently work in six countries across East Africa. So on this slide, I'm trying to illustrate what we do. So by listening to farmers, we've developed um, what we, we think is a complete solution that enables smallholder farmers to significantly increase their farm income and hopefully grow their way out of hunger and, and poverty. And that service bundle uh, that we've developed has four key components. Firstly, financing. Financing in-kind of farm inputs, such as seed and fertilizer. Secondly, the distribution of those inputs. So we distribute those orders to the rural areas where all of our clients live. Thirdly, uh, we provide training on modern agricultural techniques and, and farming best practices with a focus on increasing yields and improving uh, long-term soil health and that type of thing. And then lastly, market facilitation to help our clients maximize the profits they realize from their harvest sales. So this service bundle has those four key components and like links in a chain, we, we, we think they all need to be there. And if any one of those links falls away, it undermines the whole model. So here's how we do it. Um, it all comes down to a repeatable, scalable model. First, we take our field officer, uh, of which we now have several thousand. Each one of them provides this service bundle I've just described directly to the farmer. And they serve around 200 farmers each. So including those farmers' families, that means they're each impacting around 1,000 people with these services. And we measure our success as an organization. We measure our success in our ability to make more farmers more prosperous. So on this slide, I'm, I'm I want to take a look at uh, the profit that, that our farmers are realizing. Um, each season, we, we physically weigh harvests and we compare the farm profits of a random set of one acre plant farmers to a random set of either likely to enroll or, or newly enrolled farmers. So we're trying to form a highly similar comparison or control group. So the dollar gain in farm income that you see here is calculated as the differential profits of one acre fund and this comparison group of farmers on the products, based on the products and services that, that we offer, that we sell. And if you're interested in learning about the, the details of this impact methodology, there's a lot more uh, information on our website. But as you can see here, our clients on average uh, made $137 increase in their profits last year. And just to give you a bit of context, the average loan size that we disperse is about $75. So it's a pretty decent return. So that's farm of profit. I want to take a quick look at scale. We not only aim to deliver the highest possible impact to each of our clients, but we also want to serve as many smallholder farmers as we possibly can. So this graph shows that we've grown quickly over the last few years in particular. Um, we currently serve more than 400,000 smallholder farmers and we're continuing to grow quick. We dispersed, last year we dispersed around about $35 million worth of inputs and other goods and our peak loan book value was around $15 million. So we're now operating at scale in four countries, that's Kenya, Tanzania, uh, Rwanda and Burundi. And we've just launched core operations in two new countries, in Malawi and Uganda. So that's uh, an exciting time for us, and we announced that earlier in the year. But, you know, despite this, the rapid growth that we've had as an organization, this slide, uh, I think, does a nice job of demonstrating that this is really just the tip of a very large iceberg. Here we are in the bottom left-hand corner. Uh, with a small number of clients that we're serving. And as you can see, 
there are nearly 50 million households that need these types of services across Africa. And we strongly believe as an organization that smallholder finance is the, is the single greatest opportunity for scale and impact in financial inclusion today. As you can see on this slide, we have a strategy to reach a million of those households by 2020, and that's going to be uh, through a combination of growth within our existing operations. So those four core countries and the two new countries uh, I've, I've mentioned, and then expansion to, to new countries as well. But you know, making a meaningful and, and lasting impact on those 50 million families is, is going to require huge effort from many, many people and many organizations. And as I mentioned, we, we really believe that this is the greatest opportunity for scale and impact in financial inclusion. So we're working closely with the financial inclusion sector and a number of key players to try and support a more systemic change in growth and to improve the overall availability of quality financial services for farmers. And in doing that, we've identified these additional strategic pillars for partnerships. And this is you know, going beyond the growth of our core program and looking at how we can collaborate with others uh, to try and tackle this, um, this huge challenge. So firstly, to foster collaboration, uh, we're creating a farm finance database so practitioners can learn from one another's operations quicker and easier than ever before. And uh, we have a very exciting partnership with Mixed Market on that front. Uh, secondly, to foster collaborate, uh, sorry, to, to strengthen a community of practice, we've also assembled a practitioner association called Propagate. Um, and again, you can read more on that on, on the website propagatecoalition.org. Um, but that includes some of the some of the biggest and most innovative implementers in the world and. It's a group that's interested in lowering the barriers to entry for smallholder finance, enabling more growth, both across the, the group members' portfolios, but also uh, across the wider smallholder finance sector. And, uh, and finally, to, to break down the operational challenges of rural lending that you know, so many of us are familiar with, we're building operational partnerships with banks and MFIs uh, to develop more innovative and more robust farm finance products um, and you know on that front for example we have an exciting partnership uh, at pilot stage now in, uh, in Tanzania with BRAC um, where we developed a, a new product with them to, to hopefully serve some of their smallholder farmer clients in a more impactful way. So hopefully that's a, a good introduction to, to the work we're doing, where we're doing it and, and the sort of scale and impact we're having. I know there's plenty to discuss. So I'll finish there and hand back over to Alberto. Thanks. Many thanks, Mike. Really interesting to hear and learn more about uh, the way I, one agro business is lending and providing bundle services to smallholder farmers. Can we then now hear from you what Root Capital is doing as well? Hello, can you guys hear me? Yeah, we can hear you, Ben. Excellent. Um, uh, good morning, everyone. It's great to be here. Um, as, uh, as Tamara uh, pointed out, my name is Ben Schmerler, and I work at a social enterprise called Root Capital. Um, Root Capital is a nonprofit social investment fund. Um, we've been in business for about 16 years, um, and what we do is we help raise income, stabilize employment, and improve quality of life for small-scale farmers and workers, um, and in some situations, consumers in Africa, Latin America, um, and Southeast Asia. We do this by building financial management capacity and then investing in agricultural businesses that bring farmers together by the hundreds or the thousands and link them to local and international markets. And in this context, when we think about agriculture, very similarly to Mike, um, we all are thinking probably about a woman in the field tilling soil with a hand hoe um, to eke out a living, and that is obviously um, frustratingly present across much of, um, a much of many parts of the Global South. But with greater access to inputs like quality seed and fertilizer, technology, training, markets, 
capital and aggregation, this woman becomes part of a very complex and exciting value chain, one that goes well beyond just to focus on farming to become a driver for larger scale industrial transformation, including value added processing and packaging, cold storage facilities to ensure that goods get from farm to consumers. My point basically is that agriculture is particularly well suited to entrepreneurial development and technological innovation. And if ag is supported like other sectors, we can replace that image um, of the impoverished farmer working, um, tilling the soil with one of high impact businesses that enable those farmers to earn a decent living, feed local populations, and form the backbone of entire economies. And so that's in a nutshell who we are and how we get there. Um, this first slide basically just underscores what I was talking about uh, earlier. You can kind of see here um, the GDP uh, that is uh, encompassed in many sub-Saharan African countries and then the actual amount of investment that's going into it. So there is a dearth of financing available for ag sector in, in Africa, which continues to constrain um, growth um, and opportunities for impact with rural livelihoods. Root um, differently than one acre. Uh, our average loan size um, is not $75, it's uh, about $300,000. Um, we operate in this space that you can see on the slide, what we call the missing middle of finance, um, really between $50,000 and about $2 million. Um, too large um, and, and different than microfinance and too um, small, too risky, and too remote for um, for commercial banks and even in a lot of cases, local banks. Um, we believe in the powerful um, transformation that small and growing businesses and that aggregation of smallholder farmers and the jobs that are created at aggregation are one of the ways to transform the agricultural sector. And so we focus um, all of our business on um, creating better small and growing businesses in the Global South. Our clients, on average, aggregate around 2,000 producers. Um, they generate annual revenues of about $4 million. They link farmers to stable value chains and pay them a higher share of the end price. Um, we really, as Root Capital, part of our ethos is to focus on frontier clients, um, really early stage, high impact businesses whose growth we can accompany over time. Um, for 75% of our clients, Root Capital is there first and or primary lender. Um, so we focus on early stage businesses in multiple geographies. In 2015, uh, we worked across 25 countries. Um, one of the ways that I mentioned at the onset, um, we do financing directly to agricultural businesses and I can get into the nuts and bolts of that uh, during the Q&A. Um, and then additionally, one of the major barriers for a lot of our clients is that they're accessing capital for the first time they don't have the right processes and systems in place to actually manage that capital responsibly and turn it into growth capital. And so we have, um, we have an advisory services arm that goes alongside the capital, think like some type of rural MBA program. Um, and what we do there is we help develop financial management knowledge, skills, and tools for these SMEs um, that helps to both de-risk our investment it helps to facilitate a higher quality lending portfolio um, and helps to actually open the aperture and be able to finance more businesses than we would otherwise be able to. Um, you know, one of the things that is, I think, probably interesting for this call is the, um, the most common training request that we get from our clients uh, is on the accounting side. And we've done recent expansion into agronomic extension, um, mostly led by uh, some of the coffee leaf rust crisis that's happened in the Americas. And we've been doing long-term renovation lending there and to de-risk that and to make sure our clients are not taking on bad credits um, or things that they can't service. We have started hiring agronomic extension agents to help them think about long-term investments. Um, we are, have expanded into mobile, which is really an exciting expansion for us because it's actually around taking um, big climate data and translating it into digestible business risks so that our clients can actually um, respond, to, uh, respond to things that are um, within their control versus looking at something so meta as climate change, um, and then uh, entrepreneurship and leadership. 
Um, in 2015, we haven't closed 2016 yet, we provided over 2,500 days of training um, in about 25 geographies um, to directly to our clients. Um, just to give you a sense of who we are, our scale, um, in 2016, this summer, we reached uh, a milestone for ourselves of $1 billion um, of loan disbursements, uh, reaching 5.6 million household members. Um, that six, uh, that, that also includes, you know, doing 2,054 loans, um, 628 borrowers, uh, four quarter rolling disbursement of about 137 million, and an outstanding balance today of 101 million. Um, the, one of the things that I think is really exciting about this number is that $1 billion in disbursements has led to $6 billion in enterprise revenue um, for the businesses we financed, and $4.8 billion of that revenue has been paid directly to farmers um, all across the globe. This is just give you a sense here. Um, of, of where we get that capital. As I mentioned at the onset, we are a nonprofit social investment fund. We have um, a balance sheet, and then we have um, money uh, from philanthropic organizations that help to cover our losses in our portfolio because um, anything we do under about $400,000 is a loss leader um, for us. Um, but right here, you get a kind of sense of who are the investors in our fund. Um, government and multilateral makes up a lot of it is OPIC, uh, USAID, IFC, um, et cetera. Uh, foundations, you can see them on the right. Uh, corporates, I think the most interesting thing here on the corporate side is that Starbucks, out of its treasury department, made a $15 million investment into Root Capital's fund. Um, and then it goes out and is, uh, and it finances things like coffee renovation, um, input finance, uh, working capital, et cetera. Um, and then we have uh, institutional, um, these are like wealth managers, an individual, and I think the thing that's really exciting about the, this chart is that um, over the course of the last 16 years, we've built a, a network of about 230 investors who are invested inside of Root Capital, and um, the, the largest chunks of money are coming from government and multilateral, but the largest number of actual investors is the individual and institution, um, and it shows you the kind of growth and expansion of the impact investing market and the people wanting to put uh, their dollars into things for um, social and environmental good. And just to give you a kind of a, a sense of where we are today on the fund, um, we have you know total notes payable uh, as of end of as of end of last year uh, of 102 million, um, number of investors 233. Uh, the weighted average return is about 2.3 percent. Um, you can see the, pres the percentage of renewed investments. Um, from our uh, from our from our lenders, um, and we've repaid our lenders at a turn of 100%. Um, this year, we've been going through a systematic understanding of our risk and impact, um, which I can talk about short momentarily. Um, but over the course of 16 years, uh, we have had a historical um, loan repayment rate from our clients at about 95%. And you know, similar to Mike. Uh, point about, you know, the um, only reaching 1%. The, uh, the, the initiative on smallholder finance, um, a think tank on smallholder finance, has uh, estimated that, like, the potential addressable demand for smallholder finance is $150 billion um, for, for businesses. It's currently being um, reached, the current level is around $10 billion, and so there's this massive space um, up to grow in this marketplace, but we can't, as root capital, if you see the $100 million outstanding balance, we can't do it alone. So um, about four years ago, uh, we, uh, with a peer institutions, um, built the Council on Smallholder Agricultural Finance, where peers, com aka competitors, and practitioners get together to think about things like underwriting standards, how do we work out deals over indebtedness, um, and just building responsible lending practices for this burgeoning industry of smallholder agricultural finance. Um, and then in addition to that, um, we do a really, um, have a concerted effort through a strategy that we call our Catalyze Strategy um, to promote our learnings, our sharing our tools and our best practices 
so that other people that are entering the marketplace, one, they don't have to reinvent the wheel, and they can actually utilize some of the things that we're learning in real time to make this market work more efficiently. And I want to leave it there as, uh, as my last slide, and we can, uh, we can dig into the details. Thanks very much. Thank you, Ben and Mike both. Uh, Alberto, are you still with yeah. us? I know we've had some audio yeah, yeah, yeah. connections yeah. with various participants. Oh, very good. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ben, for giving us that introduction about Root Capital. It's impressive to see the uh, lending operations that you are contacting and especially the leverage ratio. We would like to now ask you a few questions more to both of you. Uh, around your lending models that you are operating so our participants and attendants today in the webinar can get a better understanding. So I would like to start with you, Mike, if possible, and then get a better understanding of how successful is your agri lending model and what data do you have to actually reflect that to other bankers, MFIs, and other lenders that are attending today this webinar. And what are the key factors, briefly, that you believe generate those successful results. Yeah, thanks, Alberto. Um, I mean, I think, you know, we believe that it's a successful model. Um, I think success for us primarily means means it's impactful. And I think, you know, some of the data uh, we shared and our methodology around measuring, you know, physically weighing harvests and really focusing on what was the agricultural impact um, mm -hmm of our lending, you know, we provided the inputs on credit and we provided training. So what was the impact on the farm and how much how much more money does the farmer have in their po pocket after uh, the season? And so we use that data to, to measure our success. And, you know, as I pointed out, we have something like, you know, $140 of income gain per farmer. Um, that's, you know, across, you know, we now have 400,000 farmers, so you're talking more than $50 million worth of additional money in farmers' pockets in East Africa as a result. So we certainly think it's, it's making more farmers more prosperous. Um, and then I suppose, you know, looking at things like repayment rates, they're very comparable with more, I would say, vanilla microfinance loans. You know, we would expect uh, repayment rate across all of our countries to be 97, 98%, um, often more. So to me, that's comparable with the, the sort of traditional, more urban lending repayment rates you see in, in many uh, MFIs. And in terms of, of key factors, um, I think the focus on impact is a big one for us. Uh, I think that actually delivering impact, showing impact, really also helps reduce the risk of working uh, in agriculture because, uh, you know, when farmers have more money in their pockets and more food grown in their fields, they, they're they both more willing and more able to repay. Um, and we're actually starting to see a lot of spillover effect, uh, you know, with impact on people who are farming, not taking uh, services from one acre fund, but being surrounded by one acre fund farmers is having a spillover effect on other non-clients and, and their um, the quality of their yields and their income. So I think the, the focus on impact has been a, a big thing. Uh, I think two other things, probably the listening to farmers and developing products to specifically meet their needs. That's a, a very high priority for us. And all, all of our leaders are based in the fields uh, where we work. Um, so we're very close to our clients. And then execution in the field. Uh, I think this is a really big one. I think One Acre Fund has um, been able to build a very strong team. We employ nearly five, around 5,000 people now in East Africa and um, kind of really executing our model well in the field, I think has, has also been a, a secret to, to part of the success. Thank you very much, Mike. Uh, is it's actually phenomenal to hear uh, how one acre is basically tailoring products and services to clients and how demand driven and focus on impact it is. Uh, ben, could you also please share with us uh, what you believe are the key factors of success for Root Capital? Yeah. 
great, Mike. So great, and I and I just I, I want to I wanted to say out there like I love One Acre Fund and um, have have been a, a an individual donor to the organization for uh, a few years because I I have admire you guys' work so much directly to farmers. I think um, all of the things that Mike said ring true for us. Um, you know, I would say that like the. Um, the, the different, the kind of key difference is that we work uh, at more at the business level um, than the directly with the farmers. And um, some of the the key factors for success that we find are um, ultimately the strength and depth of the management team. Um, that continues to be the key indicator on um, risk uh, in our portfolio. Um, and then other things are, that exist there are loan tenor. Um, what we've learned is that uh, um, a one-year working capital loan, um, you provision around 3 to 5 percent. Um, and the loan that if it's a three-year capital expenditure loan, um, that has to be provisioned more like 12 to 15 percent in year one. And so it's about three times more risky to do um, longer deals uh, than, than some of the shorter working capital ones. And so um, we're having, uh, having, you know, proximity or client um, similar to One Acre, uh, we have uh, local staff in all of the geographies where we're working who are trained in banking, financing, um, banking, finance, uh, agronomy, or, or some combination thereof, um, who work really closely and directly uh, with our clients. In addition to um, the two I mentioned earlier, um, geography, uh, product, um, country, uh, those things all make a difference um, in terms of, of risk. Um, and so what we've done over the past year and a half is go through about 1,200 of our deals um, over the past decade and started to map them on an access that shows risk, um, risk, profitability, and impact, and starts to give us a lot of interesting data points um, in, like, if you thought about it from a quadrant perspective, um, on high-risk, high-impact deals, low-risk, low-impact deals, you know, um, high-impact, high-risk, uh, higher impact, low risk, and low impact, uh, low high risk. And so what we can start to do now is look at all of those uh, deals across our entire portfolio and start to segment and decide where do we allocate um, subsidy and how do we select our deals um, based on their kind of risk, risk slash return and impact, um, uh, and impact uh, index. And what it allows for us to do is to just be better at targeting, um, like, really scarce resources to the highest impact opportunities. Um, this week we're going to uh, publish a new piece in the Stanford Social Innovation Review around this. It's called our, our Efficient Impact Frontier, and it's just a better way of thinking about how do you actually um, target the most, uh, the, the, the highest impact yields that might have a lot of risk. Um, and you know, ultimately, how do you segment your portfolio in a way that the economics um, makes sense um, along with uh, your impact case? Okay, Ben, thank you very much. That sounds uh, really interesting. We would like to now proceed with the following question for both of you, uh, which many of the attendants today to the webinar may be considering. What are the main challenges that your agri lending model faces in terms of risk and in terms of other factors that basically discourage financial institutions or lenders uh, usually in developing countries from lending to smallholder farmers. What are the main challenges that you highlight and how do you deal with them? Mike? Yeah, sure. Um, challenge, I mean, for us, sustainability is an obvious one. Uh, you know, we're, we're, we're a non-profit, but we, we do try and operate very much like a business. Um, but we're not yet sustainable, so uh, our interest in, in sort of fee income is not yet covering 100% of our field operating costs. It covers around about 80% of our costs today. Uh, on average, it varies country to country, so some of, in some, some places we're uh, a bit higher than that. Um, so that's a challenge. I mean, even within agriculture, which is a challenging sector, we're specifically focused on largely on staple crop farmers. And if you think back to the 
uh, the ISF inflection point report, which was published earlier this year. There's, they categorize farmers and these sort of loosely connected to value chain farmers, which is really where our clients fall. So they're expensive clients to reach. Um, I mean, I think some of them, it would be challenging to ever reach them in a sustainable way, but yeah. uh, but certainly some of them it's possible. So, you know, we're doing a few things to try and overcome that where uh, where it's suitable, where, you know, working to allow uh, farmers to increase their transaction sizes, uh, if that's appropriate. We have grown the caseload of our field offices substantially over the last few years and, and continue to do that um, while balancing, you know, the, the quality and level of training we provide. And we've also shifted to a lot more uh, use of mobile repayments. So, for example, all of our, you know, hundred and I can't remember what it is now, 130,000, 40,000 plus getting on 200,000 farms in Kenya uh, repay using M-Pesa. Um, and when the other operating countries we're in, when the environment allows it, um, I'm sure we'll go the same way there. So, uh, yeah, working on that, but that that's definitely a big challenge. Yeah, I think um, from, from our perspective, uh, it's an interesting year to talk to us because um, the risk in our portfolio, um, risk among other CSAF lenders that counsel on smallholder agricultural finance, and even risk that we just saw just came out of um, some of the research done in U.S. agricultural markets, the risk in ag is up three times right now. And so um, I think some of the biggest challenges, I would bucket them in, in three categories, really. It's around the capital supply. Is there the right types of capital available in the marketplace? There, at this point in time, we feel like there's a lot of low-cost debt that is seeking an impact return. Um, what there is not a lot availability of is large tranches of um, of, you know, what you could call kind of like philanthropic equity or um, equity grant net assets um, that sits on our balance sheet that protects our senior lenders or our subject um, note holders um, from any of the losses. And so, like, we're in a sense right now constrained by the amount of equity that we can actually raise that sits on our balance sheet in perpetuity. And, like, that equity means um, that, like, we can only serve a, a, seg a certain segment of the marketplace because of um, what I had mentioned before, that the majority of our loans um, are not sustainable to serve, and we believe from our impact case that, like, you know, taking early stage businesses and growing them over time is our role, but part of that role is to graduate them to um, more commercial or local banks and then go back and finance the next stage, uh, or next round of early stage businesses and so the capital structure piece and the right types of capital in the marketplace is, is, a, is a driving constraint today. Now, there are big opportunities on the horizon that we can see, things like the Green Climate Fund um, and potential like growth capital uh, um, coalitions, but until that money actually lands on our balance sheet, we will be constrained um, just in our capital structure. The other side, um, the next piece is probably around uh, the capital demand side, I mentioned this earlier. Uh, we last year financed 300 businesses. Um, we trained another 300 businesses in addition to that. Um, uh, we have a business development team that goes out and looks for clients um, or potential clients across a number of geographies. For every 100, 100 potential businesses we look at, we probably finance about five of them. And so the, the top of the funnel is very wide, but the ability for us to actually finance these businesses um, is, is quite low. And in a lot of ways, if root capital is unable to, and it's oftentimes related to our capital structure, as well as you know, some of their, their capacity constraints, if we're unable to finance them, it's most likely that they're left locked out of the banking system. So you have this capital structure issue, you have a capital um, demand issue, and then you know, Mike had mentioned a little bit earlier um, um, you know, around like geography, around local markets, et cetera, you have, um, you have an enabling environment issue. Um, right now, uh, you know, climate change, currency, 
commodity prices, um, all of them are really complex issues. So when you're talking about working with, um, let's call it coffee farmers in Guatemala, all the climate data suggests that like in, you know, 15 to 20 years, they need to transition to something else. And so like, how do we help them do that transition elegantly? Um, then you have commodity prices, which are up and down, up and down, and they've had seen historic volatility um, ever since the economic downturn in 2008. And then a lot of the opportunity for us that we see is in local currency lending. Um, the first year that we started to do local currency lending uh, was in around 2014. Um, we put money into Ghana in the Ghanaian CD. Um, almost immediately, the Ghanaian CD lost 40% of its value to the U.S. dollar. And so um, this kind of exogenous currency, um, they're very, very volatile, especially as it pegs to hard currencies, and there's currently not any type of financial product in the marketplace that um, is cost effective, that where you can take a $50,000 loan and hedge your risk against that. And so we're, we're a little bit constrained on the capital side there, but it feels more like um, something that is, is macro across uh, exotic currencies broadly. And so those kind of three places, the capital supply, capital demand, and enabling environment, they are um, places where there's really large potential, um, but we have to unlock some of the, um, or overcome some of the challenges that are facing uh, each, of those, each of those kind of verticals um, to actually grow this thing to a certain scale. And when Mike had made the point before around, you know, there are certain segments of the market that might not ever be sustainable to serve, we, we, we wholeheartedly agree. Um, and if we want to actually serve them, we need to figure out the right types of capital and the right types of risk sharing facilities to be able to do so. Alberto, I think you're on mute if you're um, trying to ask a follow-up question. Yeah, thank you, Ben, for sharing uh, the insights about root capital. Uh, we would like to open the floor now to all participants to start asking you questions, if that's right with you. We already have a few questions that they've been asking, and I would like to start directing those questions to you. So for Mike, uh, we have a colleague uh, whose name is Brad, who is asked, is interested to learn more about the MPLs and the interest rate that one acre is offering versus commercial rates. How do they differ? I mean, if you can share that information with us. Yeah. Um, our, I mean, our, our rates vary from country to country. Um, but I, uh, so, you know, yeah, it's a different figure across all six countries. Um, but it, it generally is comparable and competitive with uh, you know, the interest rates charged for the equivalent um, equivalent size loans in those markets, you know, so in those kind of microfinance markets. Um, so if you were to look on something like microfinance transparency, um, it, it, it sort of compares quite, quite favorably uh, with organizations meeting a similar client segment. Um, having said that, you know, as I mentioned, it's, we're not fully sustainable, so uh, that rate is is not covering all of our all of our costs. Um, and and I think rather than trying to rather than trying to increase the rate to plug that gap, we're we're looking to drive uh, more cost efficiencies down um, to to try and bridge that gap between the two. Um, yeah, so I think it's uh, for the market segment where we're reaching, uh, it, it, it's competitive. Um, Although it's it's obviously higher than you know say the rate charged to uh, an urban borrower borrowing a thousand dollars in in Nairobi you know it's uh, it's higher to it's a higher cost to to lend seventy five dollars in Western Kenya. Excellent. Uh, and only question, Mike, if you don't mind, uh, we are receiving from our audience. Are uh, beneficiaries uh, paying for the services received for the bundle of services like? financial training, access to markets, and so on, or is, are those prices embedded into the principal plus the interest? 
Yeah, so again, like this does change a bit country to country. Um, in some countries, it's just sort of, you know, one, uh, one flat cost for all the bundle of services. In other countries, it's, it's broken out more. Um, so, you know, you would, you would be paying uh, a certain amount for, um, you know, delivery of your inputs plus the cost of the inputs plus the interest, for example. Um, so yeah, exactly how, how the price structure, it changes in, in different markets and uh, according with, you know, sort of either local regulations or client preferences um, or, or our internal systems. Um, but, you know, ultimately the, the clients are um, always paying uh, at least a contribution towards that total cost, if not the whole cost. Excellent. Thank you, Mike. Uh, ben, we would like to ask you also a few questions. Uh, some of our colleagues in the audience are interested to learn more about the trainings that you are providing. Are they provided by grants? Are they paid by the small businesses receiving those trainings? And they are interested also to know if you have any technology services that are being offered, like for weather data, crop insurance, or anything like that. Yeah, great, great question. We um, we do the trainings uh, directly uh, in, we have, a, we have a different model in Africa and Latin America, we do those trainings directly. The majority of those trainings um, and that, that services um, are provided through philanthropic contributions um, uh, alongside oftentimes of some of our, our debt as well. Um, there are in some instances we will be hired by um, development agencies or institutions, um, call it TechnoServe or Heifer International, um, to provide uh, training to uh, businesses that are part of their larger programs. Um, and then in, in other instances, um, but very few and far between, uh, we, we get uh, clients to pay for um, uh, that training. Um, the majority of it is, uh, is philanthropically funded. Um, and then the second uh, part of your question, can you repeat it, Alberto? Yeah, we, they would like to be they're interested to learn more whether you are offering any kind for both of you any kind of crop insurance. Yeah, um, Mike, I'm not sure where you guys are on your on your journey in crop insurance. We've been doing a lot of work around um, mobile, and it's been mostly around um, downscaling, as I mentioned earlier, climate data. Um, to make it digestible business risks um, for our clients. So um, that looks like uh, working with the Interna International uh, Institute for Tropical Agriculture um, to do climate mapping on specific exposure gradients, looking at both um, uh, temperature and, uh, and, 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 uh, and moisture uh, over the course of the next 25 years so that our clients can then take that information and make strategic investments in, um, in either, you know, climate mitigation, um, adding, planting new trees, um, providing certain types of inputs um, to those trees, et cetera, or they can do things around um, more adaptation um, and uh, start to transition to different tree crop systems. Um, so we've been using uh, mobile tools that we created ourselves um, to help our clients both pull the data from their farmer members and then actually push the data back out to them around uh, best practices, et cetera. As far as client, as far as, um, uh, as far as micro insurance, um, to date, we have not found um, the right solution for our model. Um, what is, what is, what has been there is that like there's weather index insurance. Um, however, it doesn't cover things like coffee leaf rust, which is um, pretty critical to, uh, to, to our portfolio and to like many of our clients throughout the Americas. Um, and so I don't think the product to date um, is exactly right for um, our farmer, the farmer members of, of our clients. And the cost thus far that we've seen, um, and we've mapped it in a few different locations, has been cost prohibitive. And the like level of aggregation that's required to bring down that cost is somewhere in the realm of 40 to 50,000 farmers, and we just don't have um, many clients who are at that scale. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Thank you, Will. Uh, Mike, anyone, anything you want to add in terms of insurance? Or? Yeah, I mean, we, um, 
So we, some of our countries are, are, are sort of more um, comprehensively covered than others. But, you know, for example, in Kenya, um, we've worked in the past with Kalima Salama and Syngenta Foundation and, and Rose Gislinger um, and our, more or less our entire uh, portfolio in, in Kenya is, is, is insured. We've used a combination of, of sort of crop insurance and um, and weather index insurance. I think we're in a unique position where we have so much data from the last 10 years on how much our farmers grow and how much they can expect to grow um, that we're able to, you know, provide some of that data to support a, a kind of a more refined insurance product. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I know that we've, we've also used uh, index insurance as well. Um, but we we don't have the same coverage in in all of our countries, and uh, you know I know that particularly for weather index insurance that just there is there are a lot of practical challenges um, with you know weather stations uh, being in the right places, being accurate enough, um, and that the, the the client's experience of weather uh, is is kind of sufficiently similar to the weather uh, recorded at a weather station and. Uh, that's a challenge because uh, you know the weather station may or may not trigger a payout, and irrespective of whether the the client you know ten kilometers away uh, experienced drought or, or not. So there's there's a lot of teething problems still, I think, with with uh, some of those insurance systems, and and we have kind of variable levels of coverage. Excellent. Thank you very much, Mike. Uh, one very quick question, if possible, for both of you, do you hedge your risk, especially root capital, because they already raised this issue, uh, do you get hedge your risk against currency devaluation? Uh, do you tend to fund crops that are export oriented at the value chain level? Yeah, um, we do hedge, we hedge our risk at a portfolio um, level. Um, and so we, you know, we, we are, we're managing that, um, you know, and we have some, uh, some solutions where we, like I said before, we don't hedge or we're having a hard time hedging is um, when we do local currency lending um, at a really small scale. And so uh, we're doing local currency lending to, right now in Ghana, um, in Togo, in Uganda, Kenya, and we, w we want to do some in Colombia as well, but um, there's not a great product in the marketplace. We've overcome that um, to a small degree by building a currency reserve with um, the Swedish International Development Agency and a couple of impact investors based in um, the Bay Area. And what we do is we tag particular deals to that reserve and, um, you know, the losses are, are absorbed by the reserve, um, and then if there's any upside on the currency swings, the, um, it gets the, some of the amount gets distributed to uh, the impact investors, the other portion of that amount gets reinvested into the fund. Unfortunately, to date, um, due to the current uh, strength of the U.S. dollar versus local currencies um, where we're working, the majority of it has been absorption of losses, uh, but the spirit is there, and I think we've got some of the structure in place to be able to do it. Um, the challenge being, like, how do you grow that, that reserve to a, a scale that allows you to um, do something more meaningful than we're able to do today? Um, but we, you know, broadly, we, we, have a, um, we, we do hedge um, the majority of our portfolio. Excellent. Thank you very much. Then uh, one other question that we would like to ask you both, and we would really appreciate a very short response if possible, is what, a, what is the key recommendation that you would give to other lenders that are attending today or that may get access to these contents and this webinar and would be interested to replicate the lending model operations that you guys are involved? What are the two or key recommendations that you've given? Yeah, happy to happy to take that one first. Um, I think for us, there's there's a lot of lessons to be learned. So, I mean, um, you know, we talked earlier um, in the in the call. I think Ben mentioned sort of trying not to reinvent the wheel and being very open to sharing. I think that's that's definitely a, a strong theme for us. And um, there's a lot of lessons to be learned through collaborating with with other organisations, and that's certainly something. 
that, that we've been doing more of. Um, and I think there's, you know, to us, smallholder finance is, it means more than just the provision of, of credit or, or a savings product. It, it means looking at, you know, the, the value chain, the sort of inputs available, uh, the technical training that's there, um, and where, where appropriate, the access to a market. So, I, I, you know, I would really encourage people to, to seek partnerships in, in those areas and, and where possible, you know, this the kind of holy grail is a sort of very sustainable partnership model where it's, it's not always going to be reliant on grant funding to, to deliver that and it's something you can deliver in perpetuity. But, um, yeah, a big, a big lesson for us is, is that there's a, there's a lot, lot to be learned and gained from, from working in collaboration with others and that's certainly something we're trying to do more of as well. Yeah, I think that, I think that um, Mike, Mike said it uh, really well there and I, I think that I would just build on um, the, the collaboration and if you look at the sustainable development goals set forth by the United Nations, um, the last one is around collaborations and partnerships. Um, and so to do this and to serve this market, um, be it at the, at the very far end of financial inclusion where One Acre is, um, or the space that Root Capital inhabits um, around uh, small and growing business lending, um, it, it's going to require all of us working in coordination um, and thinking about the highest use both of our, um, of our subsidy, um, of our capital, and our expertise and that um, over time, farmers from one acre farmers um, who are either in Root Capital's portfolio or in one acre, farm, one acre Fund's portfolio have, um, have like a, a solid place to go, um, that the end game isn't just, you know, tilling the soil for the rest um, of their lives, um, that that is not going to be something that is going to be attractive for young people in perpetuity, but there's a pathway um, for them, and that pathway has um, different stages along that trajectory um, that all of the actors who are potentially on this call or interested in this work um, can think about their most strategic role in that pathway um, so that we can get to a place where um, smallholder farmers and workers around the globe um, can live with improved opportunity, um, durability, viability, long-term resilience, et cetera. And so the collaboration piece, sharing, sharing data, um, participating on loans, um, working together uh, to kind of like build the, the bottom up, uh, I think is super important. And I think the, the collaboration on the other side, and One Acre has done um, fantastic work around this, is building out um, partnerships with governments um, to create a, a better enabling environment for farmers and for this type of work to thrive. Okay, thank you very much both for uh, answering all these questions. I don't know if there is anything else that you would like to add. Otherwise, we would like to, I will give the word to Tamara, but we would like to thank you very much for joining us today, for sharing your expertise and your knowledge and for dedicating this time to us. Uh, this webinar, as you all know, is being recorded, and then we are happy to continue the conversation over email or reaching out to us or to the website where the webinar uh, will be posted. And thank you all participants also for joining us today and sending their questions and the patients. Tamara, over to you. Yes. Thank you, Alberto. Um, thank you to all the participants once again for joining our Adventures in Smallholder Financing, a tale of two innovative lending approaches webinar. A big thank you to Mike Warmington of One Acre Fund and Ben Schmerler of Root Capital for sharing both their experiences and recommendations. We sincerely apologize for any technical issues of this webinar and will address those immediately. The webinar recording will be available to you at the World Bank's agrofinfacility.org website. And stay tuned, we have an upcoming webinar, not uh, officially scheduled the date yet, but the subject will be Women's World Banking, presented by Anna Gintrman. Thank you all to everyone. We appreciate your time and have a wonderful day.